destination, Coos County, New Hampshire. 9.30 p.m., mid-September 1973. Joseph Cottrell, 42, a machinery inspector, was sitting in his kitchen studying for a private pilot examination. His wife Alice and Wayne, his 19-year-old son, were in the living room watching television. Cottrell suddenly felt the urge to go outside and get a breath of fresh air. As he approached the rear door, he observed what he thought was a huge ball of fireflies, approximately 1,500 feet from him. He then walked a few stairs to the ground level and began walking up the driveway. He had planned on going to investigate the bizarre light. As he walked a few more yards, the ball of light seemed to break into seven units of much smaller, six-foot to nine-foot diameter balls, and these converged in his direction very rapidly and very quietly. The colors were green similar to a firefly's light and changed to a whitish and to warm reds continually. They came to within a thousand feet from Cottrell at a height of about 50 feet above ground, arranged in two groups containing three lights in one and four in the other. Cottrell could not believe what was happening. It was at this moment he realized that intelligent beings were inside those balls of light. Cottrell himself did not understand how he knew this, as he could not actually see the beings, but he knew they were there. He thought to himself, or said out loud, he could not remember, Why me? He received an answer telepathically. It said, Why not you? Cottrell thought they seemed friendly, whomever they were. He continued to observe their craft. He wondered about the composition and energy source. He noticed that there was no noise coming from the objects at all. He was amazed and scared at the same time. They continued to stare at each other for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. Around this time, Cottrell thought that he needed to take a picture. He ran to the front door, which was about 30 feet away, and yelled to his son and wife to come outside and look. He loaded his camera. His son grabbed his 22 while Cottrell grabbed his shotgun, which was propped up in the corner. Cottrell's wife remained watching TV, showing no interest in going outside or even looking out the window. Cottrell found this a little strange in hindsight. Wayne and I bolted out the door and there they were, waiting, but they had moved the four units 150 to 200 feet away and 35 feet above the ground. The three units had moved northerly, 40 to 50 feet away. As I maintained my awe, Wayne and I got back to back, he watching three units and I watching four. Wayne and I were talking as I was worried for our safety. Suddenly they asked, Are you going to shoot us? I was standing with a camera and gun and strangely never did use either. I felt ridiculous and said, no, that is how we humans are. At that moment, a beam of light appeared at Cottrell's feet. In his mind, he heard them ask if they could examine him. Cottrell worried that it might hurt, but it didn't much matter as the examination had already commenced. It started at his feet and toes and moved up his body rapidly. He noticed that the light spent more time examining the areas of old injuries. It then moved on to his brain and he could feel the beam as it was adjusted to varied intensities, widths and speeds and so on. He got the sense that they were making a sort of quote, Xerox copy of him, copying everything about him down to the cell structure, a spectrograph analysis on the highest order. They seemed to be acting with greed and glee, so to speak. I was not overly apprehensive, but the beam began to increase its energy to the point of becoming very uncomfortable. At this point I said, Hey, you said it wouldn't hurt. Immediately I felt the beam energy lessen at least 40%, continuing all the while talking. I was thrilled and amazed that it was possible to telepathically communicate. It was during this moment that Cottrell was given images of, quote, glass-like cities energy systems and components. 
Cottrell did not indicate if the world he was shown was theirs or a future version of ours. The visitors stressed to him that humans should not use nuclear energy as it was extremely dangerous. Cottrell also understood that the human race would not survive the next 2,000 years without some kind of an arrangement with them. He did not elaborate on this beyond that. About an hour had passed and the objects had come very close and were getting closer. Cottrell sensed that they wanted them to go with them. He remembered wondering where they would take them. When would they bring them back? Would they even bring them back at all? I started to get apprehensive and downright scared. I then held my hand out as a signal for them to stop, as it seemed they would be right where we were in only a few seconds. The signal worked. They immediately returned to their previous position for a few more minutes and out went their glow. They were gone. MUFON member Lorraine Duchesne looked into Cottrell's story. He also told his story to the New England UFO study group just a few months after it happened. In November 1974, reporter Kim Nelson published Cottrell's story in the Lancaster, New Hampshire, Coos County Democrat newspaper. Nils noted that on the night Cottrell believed the incident happened, UFOs were also reported in Gorham, Colebrook, Stafford, Littleton, Miles Pond, Peacham, and Sutton, Vermont. It was a busy night for the visitors, I guess. The New England study group, as per their article in their November 1981 newsletter, noted that the detail about seeing glass-like cities and warnings of nuclear energy was not mentioned in Cottrell's previous telling to them, and that new detail seems to have been added or Cottrell intentionally left it out for fear that it sounded too fantastical. The Nelson article also pointed out that after having his encounter, Cottrell became quite obsessed with UFOs. Cottrell had been a federal civil servant for 18 years before retiring on a disability pension. Following his retirement, he had been employed as a steam generator inspector for eight years up to the time of his sighting. After the UFO encounter, Cottrell felt a deep desire to seek out UFOs and other experiencers and spent all of his life savings and much of his pension income on trips across the U.S. doing just that. No surprise this sudden change of life was not embraced by his wife Alice, who was not interested in the topic at all. After 23 years of marriage, the couple separated. The New England UFO study group were initially hesitant to believe Cottrell's account though they noted that sometime after Cottrell's story was told to them, they became aware of others who had very similar interactions with lights and telepathic entities, and they decided to give it a second look. Cottrell's encounter is definitely nothing new. I have covered many accounts in which witnesses observe luminous objects and then engage in a type of back-and-forth dialogue with whomever is piloting these objects. For the most part, Cottrell's encounter was friendly. The only time he really felt any true fear, it seems, is when the objects moved closer to him and his son, and he sensed they wanted to take them. Cottrell's initial sighting of the objects happened because he felt a sudden urge to go outside. Was it just a chance encounter, or had he been drawn outside by these beings? If they had the ability to speak to him telepathically, is it much of a stretch to believe that the communication started prior to Cottrell ever setting eyes on them? I wonder too if Cottrell's thought of retrieving a camera from inside his house was actually his own. As he entered the house, it gave the visitors time to change their positions. Certainly there must have been a reason behind this. Maybe they wanted to change positions to carry out their examinations, but feared that a quick position change might frighten Cottrell, so they distracted him momentarily. When he returned outside, not only with his son, but with a gun and a camera, it's interesting that he never used either, nor did his son. Certainly, if he was in control, he would have at the very least raised his camera and snapped off a picture or two. When the visitors asked if he planned to shoot them, Cottrell reacted almost in shame, noting that it was just how humans were. I wonder if this too was part of the examination process to gauge how Cottrell and his son would react. Cottrell next described being scanned. 
a common aspect of many ET encounters, he sensed that they were creating a quote, Xerox copy of his person. Though it's curious why he did not ask them what the purpose for doing this was. Many UFO researchers, including Dr. David Jacobs, believes that the visitors are engaged in a long-standing cloning, mapping, and replacement operation, a detail of which may have been hinted at by Cottrell when he indicated that the human race would at some point need to forge some type of an alliance with the visitors in order to survive. More often than not, those who are captured claim they are shown apocalyptic visions of things to come fire-strewn hellscapes awaiting us all. But Cottrell was given glimpses of another place, a place with highly advanced energy systems and futuristic cities made of glass. What was this place? Was it their world or ours? Was this a snapshot of Earth in a couple thousand years? I guess we can only hope. Thank you.